global analysis that stated that we should have six times more food from the ocean, right? Just talking about the potential. To me, it's pretty obvious that in order to feed the world, we need to we need to use more, make more use of the ocean. We need to make more use of agriculture. Do you have any general advice you give to people who want to have an impact? I think openness, honesty. You have to be very conscious to give people energy. It's basically 24-7. I'm very excited to be joined by Jon. And Jon, thank you so much for taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you. If we go down the memory lane, do you have any early memories of finance or business? Was it meant to be that you would be joining this uh, finance industry or was it ser- serendipity and luck and timing? That, that is uh, good. Actually, it's quite easy to, to answer that one because... Uh, Although my, my recollections probably fails me, uh, being a relatively old person then, but I'm totally sure that finance, business were never a topic on, at our dinner table. Uh, in, in a sense that my, my father was a professional musician and, and uh, my mother was working in kind of the education industry for a while, but she was basically at home. So, so I had a, uh, an upbringing which is very different from most people that kind of got it from the from the early days of the city. Can so you share top- what was the topics around dinner then? Was it music or culture or whatever? Yeah, but very much music, art, culture, uh, literature, but probably even more so nature. Nature, outdoor life, uh, that was really, that is probably the strongest recollection I had, I mean, we were out doing walks in the mountains or in the forest or out fishing uh, from when I was three years old or whatever. So, so that, that, that is the strongest recollection I had. So given that you have that background, what makes you interested in business? Is it after education or is it e- even before education comes into no, play? That, that, was, that is clearly after education. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and that was quite coincidental as well. I think it's, it's uh, I guess I would say that everything that I've done has been uh, a result of coincidence and not very kind of, kind of deliberate choices. Um, I think the only deliberate choice I made from kind of a career perspective was that I decided not to be a professional musician. That is the only conscious career decision I made and probably the best career decision I made as well because I think I would not be, uh, I was not, uh, and, and actually it was my father that told me that he said, yes, you are a relatively good musician, but you will you are not good enough to be a professional musician. You will not be happy in that. So, so that was one of the few times I listened to my father in, when I was young, but uh, I, I did that in this one. That's very interesting. So after education, what are sort of the first job or first opportunity that sort of leads the way into basically your job today, right? Solving business problems, working with it day in and day in out. I, I think um, I, I was very much uh, interested in, in uh, research. Uh, actually, I was uh, supposed, to, uh, supposed to take a PhD uh, in material sciences at MIT. Uh, and uh, two things happened. That was Ronald Reagan became president. So we are back in 1981, and he wanted to limit the amount of uh, non-U.S. citizens that could enter into the top universities. That was one, and another one was that the military service wanted uh, to to call me back to do my military service. So I, I actually I started, but I was I had to to go back and do so. But then I went to the uh, I, I took my military service at a research institute, uh, the Defense Research Institute, uh, which is a very good one, by the way. Uh, and uh, and after that, I, I got the job in kind of material science at uh, what is today called Nextons. Uh, at the time, was ITT. Uh, it was a kind of cable, bar and cable, and telecom uh, industry. And, and of course, in that job, you got more and more um, t- 
tilted toward, towards the business side of things, not so much only the technical development, but business side. And that was something I, I, um, I thought was very exciting. That's so awesome. I was kind of, I was moved towards the, the business side. Uh, in... Quarter is the new way of doing company research. Their first mission is to enable access to conference calls, investor presentations, transcripts, and earnings reports. Their second mission is to create a completely new way for companies to reach their investors and vice versa. Quarter is 100% free. They include companies from 15 markets today and plan to add more. They prioritize requested companies and users can now leave reactions while listening to the conference calls. So make sure to follow them on Twitter at Quarter App. Given this sort of background story, which sector did you work with the most in your 20s and 30s? Is it seafood? Is it something else? How did you like develop your strengths? Is it like, uh, what was like the most influential sector you worked with? I think, um, let's say, I guess that must have been in material science. I mean, I worked in large industrial groups. I worked with polymers. I, uh, I worked with oil and gas. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, let's say cables for oil and gas, uh, but it's still in the cable industry. Um, I went to to Geneva to work in the R and D lab to do semiconductor polymers, which was very interesting. Uh, so I was there for five years. Um, so, so let's say that, that must have been, from an industrial point of view, large industries, uh, material science, uh, applied material science, that is, uh, and improve kind of products that you see in daily life uh, around you. So it was far from biotech, far from agriculture, far from finance and, and everything else. But this is super interesting because if you look at the sort of like gas, uh, solar, wind, hydropower, and given the time you worked on this, like, could you predict this future today? Or did you think that obviously everything is going to be oil? Or did you think solar is going to be much bigger than it is? Because when you're working with these things at this time, could you see this prediction that we have today? Or was it something that you thought would happen that didn't play out the way you thought working on these things? No, I, I think... Uh... I don't think I realized at the time, but I give you one example, which was quite mind-boggling, and that was when I did did my diploma thesis. I was in 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 Denmark doing that, uh, and then I worked. Uh, that was not part of my thesis, by the way, but I worked on the project there to uh, to split water into oxygen and, and hydrogen with extremely little use of of energy. And, and how can you do that? Yes, if you are very clever in material science, you can make some doped electrodes that do do something with the energy gap between the hydrogen and oxygen in that molecule. So you you lower the energy or the, the uh, it's called bone bending. Uh, and we actually managed to manage to to uh, split uh, water by the use of sunlight. The thing is, and that was in 1981. The thing is that to do that in 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 a scale, even the in laboratory scale, we, we did it was tough to manage because you need to collect the gases and they're explosive, etc. So I think to to I was just saying, I mean, if this works, if you can split or produce oxygen and hydrogen or hydrogen, that is, if you want to do that with very little energy, you probably basically solve the energy energy issue. And and the institution I was on, that was one that the Danish authorities built at the time they thought they were doing nuclear energy, which they decided not to do early on, but they still have the facilities. And um, some of my colleagues there were working on on fusion energy, which of course is, is still a wet dream for, for many people that cares about energy. Um, I was working a little bit with with uh, with silicon and doping silicon, which which you do, which I did many many years later in in uh, in uh, making solar wafers. So I was not not new to that. I saw that could happen, but I didn't really envisage. That will be a long stretch to say that I envisage uh, how to how to 
let's say that solar and wind with uh, with the Provail as it has been today. The only thing I think can say at that time was that I, I understood the power of hydrogen. And we even had another project, which was EU funded by Daimler Benz as well, was to store hydrogen on grinded magnesium, where you basically can store the same thing you can do with a big pressure bottle. You could store that in, in kind of a one kilo gram plastic bag with, with magnesium. The only problem with that is it's uh, extremely dangerous. And uh, we even drove cars on it. So, so it, it was handleable, but I think in mass production, it's, it's going to be very, very, uh, very, very tough. So at least I can say that I, I understood that hydrogen would be an important energy carrier at the time, although we saw all the technical problems of making it and, and storing it, etc. But, uh, and, and, uh, but I think the world has evolved a little bit since then. That's so fascinating to hear. So if we're trying to conclude on that sort of experience, if you have to take sides, are you on sort of the, this will be energy abundance all over the world as soon as the technology will figure something out? Or are you more on like, this is scarce resources. We need to really plan and optimize all the time or somewhere in between. Because some people say that technology will solve energy in, in the end. It just depends what technology will be. While some say that it's very scarce resource, we need to plan extremely carefully and manage to not overheat the planet, etc. It's a very good question. I, I, let's say I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm a technology optimist to, to, to start there. Um, but I think we need to make some hard choices, though. Um, uh, I mean, renewable energy, the way we know it today, uh, hydro, wind, solar, um, it's not going to be adequate alone. You need, so you need a base load in a system. Uh, and why something I think is a little bit scary is that it's, it's not that people are closing down uh, coal-fired plants because that is, I think, a Necessary. But I'm a little bit scared by the reluctancy to use nuclear energy. To me, that is uh, the only plausible solution, short term, to 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 make sure you provide adequate energy uh, and uh, and to avoid uh, the CO2 emissions. Um, I know this is a contro- controversial. Think probably less so today than it was two years ago. Uh, you will see that the French are, are rethinking their nuclear strategy. Um, but let's say Germany, I think, is is in big problems because they are, have closed down or are in the process of closing down their nuclear energy facilities. And and as long as uh, coal and oil is not uh, relevant, I would say, for base load energy. Clearly, their energy mix with the solar and wind is phenomenal, and it's probably the highest proportion in any country, except for those like Norway that has a lot of hydro. But um, but they need the baseload, and and I, I think it's a big mistake to 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 close down the the nuclear plants. And uh, it, it's not that that is not without an issue, but the the alternative is not good. I mean, the alternative of of continuing to emit that much. Climate gases is not is not an option in my view. How important is politicians in this scenario? Because if you look at the EU, etc., like we need, of course, global solutions. Because you can't only look at one small country. If you can't adapt that solution to India, China, or EU, it doesn't really matter. Because you know, I mean, the planet. You need to see it as a whole, right? So I don't know how much you know about the taxonomy, etc., but it seems like there's a big gray area in terms of what is green. So if you take LNG gas, it's like it's stuck in between. It's better than coal, but yeah. it's also not solar, right? So in, in terms of like how important it is to get these foundations right, how, do you, how would you like to describe this? Because obviously you invest also in green solutions, but there has to be a gray area in this space. What's green and what's not green? Yeah. I, I think... Uh... Above all, it's very, very difficult to de- determine what is green and what is not green. Um, a little bit, what I mean, clearly politicians play 
plays a pivotal role. I mean, they are the ones that say what is kind of, let's say, in the nuclear energy. I mean, if you want to close it down, that's a political decision. If you've got to expand it, that's a political decision. Um, what I've seen with a little bit of something I think is a little bit surreal is that politicians in Norway and elsewhere as well, but uh, let's say if you take Norway as an example, is very much to me symbolism. They're much into symbol politics and real politics. Uh, I give you a couple of examples. To take electricity from land, to, to take that to offshore platforms, to me is lunacy. I mean, it's pure lunacy. But at least it shows the politicians we do this because we show we can reduce CO2 emission. But the, the cost of making that solution, uh, if, if you take the overall cost of making cables, dig them down, do whatever you have to do, and also produce everything, I'm not so insured that the net result there is, is the CO2 positive. So it's a lot of symbolism. I think another one, another example that people will probably kill me when they hear, I, say, I think electrical cars has been a big mistake in Norway. We have subsidized electrical cars left, right, and center to the extent you, you must be crazy not to own an electrical car in Norway. But I think from the environment, we would have been much better off to guide uh, consumers in the direction to buy uh, small diesel engines with blue tech technology, uh, simply because the, the fact that, I mean, uh, those who have calculated, uh, done calculations on this, uh, in, uh, it will probably tell you that you need to drive a Tesla more than 150, 200,000 kilometers before it starts to be a positive contributor to, to environment. And, and it's not only, let's say, you take a city like Oslo, it, it's, not, it's not the CO2 emission that is the problem here. It, here, the problem is all the dust, the kind of uh, dust that moves around. Maybe 90% of what people feel as pollution is dust and uh, created by road, rubber, etc. And, and typically, the, the vehicles that create most of the dust are heavy vehicles with the high torque, also called Tesla. So, so this it's a kind of a simple politics, uh, simple politics that I think is 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 not real politics. It kind of shows that polit politicians are doing things like the electrification of uh, of oil rings, but it's not it's not bringing anything. So that is, I think, a big concern, and and particularly when you start to look at the taxonomy, what's in and what's out. I, to be honest, I, I think this is an extremely good exercise. However, it's a little bit dangerous exercise as well because um, if uh, I'm, or I'm more pleased that there are people in the EU that is doing it than Norwegian politicians because they are more what I call the realpolitik to, to take a German word for it, which typically I think your example with LNG is a very good example of that. And so I think natural gas would probably be okay uh, because, but, but I'm not so sure that would have been the, the answer in, in Norway. It's very interesting. And just to bring another argument, which I found fascinating, is that I think maybe the, the mistake politicians are making is that they're too worried about the short term and looking good because obviously their incentive is to be reelected. So okay. we have a perfect example in Norway, which is wind, offshore wind, right? So the whole debate is now centered, it seems to me, around that people are mad about their electricity bills. But that shouldn't guide, you know, the industry that we have to build up, which maybe we have to think 20 years ahead in terms of how do we construct it? Is it connected to EU, et cetera? But it seems like it's more about what can we say today that doesn't piss people off, right? And okay. that doesn't seem like the best way to build a new industry. No, and again, that, that is, that is uh, let's say, the fundamental problem in our democracies that, uh, that uh, any politician... Their main aim is to be re-elected, and and uh, so so you, you will have a very short uh, sight on that, and and that, that is I think a fundamental problem in many countries. But so you hope I mean in, I mean we can be very pleased that there are quite a few politicians that take a longer view and are more responsible in in, in what they do. But 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 I think offshore wind and uh, and uh, if you talk about. Uh, 
let's say, industries that are generated by political uh, decisions more than industrial financial decisions. I think some of the battery initiatives, big battery parks, is, I say, what is the financial, economical, business fundament for it? So I'm a little bit afraid that polit- it's everything that is driven by politicians and subsidies is probably not going to be the best position so, uh, after all. Again, I, I appreciate, I will be the first one to say that in order to get, say, the green ship moving, politicians need to consciously subsidize certain elements uh, and, or, or make a framework that makes, makes it possible to, to, to make business and still do a green business. But some of these things, if the politicians are too strongly involved in this, it can go terribly wrong. And, and in Norway, we have ample examples of, 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 of that over, over time. Definitely. And I think it's also just important to mention that there are so many great examples where the government is actually doing everything right to build to build industries, right? So, I mean, Norway is a perfect example if you take the oil fund or whatever, right? So from the government perspective, you can have a huge impact on the positive side as well. Absolutely. I'm not saying that every, every all initiatives, I mean, we have done some, Norwegian politicians that have done some brilliant uh, moves, uh, particularly in how we handle the oil and gas industry and, and also the, the sovereign fund. I mean, but by all means, that, that has been a stroke of genius. But, but I'm a little bit afraid when politicians start to act as if they were uh, as if they were running uh, state-owned companies, which they are not. Uh, and uh, I've had the pleasure of, of uh, working in, in some of them, both in the board position and also as a, as a uh, administration. And it's fascinating to see that that although politicians are deciding on the governance and how to govern the governance of, of, um, of say, state-owned or partly state-owned companies, but when it comes to the politicians want to change things, for instance, now when we have, let's say, Statkraft that is making tons of money here or Stopnet is making tons of money here, then the politicians want to go in and, and, and do things with, uh, as if they were the General Assembly, as if they were board or management. So, so then, then they're just looking totally away from the governance that they have actually decided themselves. And I've asked myself many times, are they doing that because they don't know what they decided? Or are they doing that because they that's a reality they don't really like, so they, they got to look a little bit away from it. And I, I tend to, politicians I met are, are basically very smart people, so I think they just forget the reality sometimes in order to make a point politically. Super interesting. So if we have this as like sort of the, um, the overview, and if we look at sort of the finance lenses, right? So... You're involved with a very successful fund, which basically has told shareholders and people around them that they're solving important problems in a green and right way, right? So mm-hmm. how would you summarize how finance has responded? Because finance is obviously their main target is to return capital, right? Mm-hmm. So they also use this as a story to bring money, bring up funds, but it's, is it only net, net positive? Or do people also need to understand that finance usually goes where the money is? It's, it's a very interesting, uh, and I would say the biggest change that I have witnessed in my lifetime is the change that took place roughly between 2015 and 2017. When, say, the finance industry went from a thesis whereby uh, companies that had a very strong ESG profile or or, um, or sustainability profile, that was kind of incompatible with the, the need for making money or the need for kind of good, getting good financial returns. Uh, and and uh, I, I know that you have talked to, to Rainer Indal, uh, and to the extent I also participated in some interviews with the, the early funds, there was clearly some reluctancy, and Randy will tell you a lot about that. Clearly, re- reluctancy to can you really make money if, if you have a sustainability profile in, in, the, in the companies you, you are seeking to is or changing? And two, three years later, people are throwing money at you. I mean, the whole entire financial industry. 
it's if you look at the, I have the pleasure of of um, of, um, of being chairman for uh, Argentum, uh, the state on fund and funds investment company, and 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 uh, in that period, so I saw that various nearly no funds had a good kind of uh, sustainability profile. All of a sudden, all of them have it, right? So it's kind of shift overnight almost. You will see that from all type of uh, mutual funds, pension funds, etc. So this is, to me, the biggest change that I have seen ever, and the quickest change. So this, of course, led to a kind of a dot-com too. Uh, because if it's a, lots of money that wants to go somewhere and, and the alternatives to investing are quite scarce, then, of course, you have companies that have been received valuations that have been totally unsustainable uh, from that. And, and of course, today, uh, one year later, we will see the effect of that. Uh, so, so this is, uh, but it, the effect of that, although people have, a lot of people have kind of lost money on investing in companies that, I mean, you, you can do that uh, both in Norway and, and abroad, and uh, companies that actually in height and up, up and away, and all of a sudden they tank. And but then you can ask yourself, well, is is this kind of lessons learned from investors that they will never again invest in companies of that nature? And I think the answer to that is that I think they still will. And that is because they don't really have that many alternatives. Because in the interim, nearly all businesses have a concert, uh, let's say, ESG philosophy or a sustainability um, philosophy because that is needed in order to have a license to operate by governments, authorities, etc. So, and, and you can also argue that uh, that is a need in order to get financing as well. But, but so, so in particular, debt financing. So, so I would say that uh, although we've seen uh, a kind of a similar dot com story, finance is still there. Although a lot of people have lost money, so so you, you can see, and, and again, the Rhino is much better uh, know this much better than I do. But but it's uh, it's fascinating to see that nearly everyone you talk to wants business to go this way. That's a great answer and summary, and I agree with it. Um, just to dive into another subject, because we already talked so much about energy. Can we spend some minutes talking about seafood? Because obviously you are involved in a very big company related to seafood. And you also had a very good career from the outside. I wasn't there in Sarmak, but Sarmak is also a huge company, which you actually led for many years. So how would you summarize your perspective and experience in seafood? Because you've seen quite a lot, I guess. No, it, it is... Um... Seafood is a, a great industry and has been a success story. Uh, I think it's important to understand why it has been a success story. Uh, if you take aquaculture, I mean, when we think seafood in Norway, we think salmon, right? But if you take a broader perspective and look at aqu aquaculture, nearly all species, from Barabundi to Pangasius to Tilapia or what have you, has been subject to boom and bust because the barriers to entry has been fairly low. And when people have success, all of a sudden, the supply side is just blowing away the um, demand side. And, and prices go down, and people start cheating in order to get the cost down, etc. So it just destroys product. I'm pretty convinced that we would have had exactly the same development in Norway if it weren't for the fact, or, or I would also argue in, in Chile and Canada and Scotland, if it weren't for the fact that the authorities have curbed production. So in many ways, in, in all these uh, countries where we produce salmon today of any, any particular size, the governments are a market regulator. I, I think if you ask the government, they would say, no, no, you're not the market regulator. But it, effectively, they are a market regulator. And um, I think that is, so I think everyone that does salmon farming in Norway should should include the government in their prayers at night to say, please continue to be a market regulator because that is a guarantee for success. I think if you had allowed allowed uh, the salmon industry 
to expand as much as I wanted, which has been the case uh, in Chile uh, in, in certain periods in time. Then you would have seen you got the boom and bust with, with the collapse of prices, but also collapse of biology. And uh, I, I had a good colleague in, in Sir time that had a very interesting saying. He, he, he was saying that when it comes to the way salmon farmers think, he said that is the individual wisdom and the collective lunacy. And by that, he said that if you ask one salmon farmer, and again, this is a very fragmented industry, many, many farmers. If you ask one person to say, yes, I can, I'd like to expand 10% because then I can make 10% more money because I see the demand, the prices are high. But the point is that every form, if everyone thinks the same way, then all of a sudden the supply, supply side is blown away and that we have the market regulators called the government that's putting a curb on that. So, so, so the salmon industry has been very successful because people have been innovative, clever, and I have tons of respect for the people that kind of works in that industry, particularly those who work out on the on the uh, at the sea site uh, and uh, doing a phenomenal job, but that industry will ch- need to change quite significantly. So I would say in ten years we have a salmon farming industry that is totally different from what we're seeing today. The, the farming methodology is totally different because I don't think society will accept uh, the environmental impact this industry has today. Uh, and demand different solutions. And it's easier to demand different solutions if they exist and they are continuing. I mean, you see more and more that people can do closed containment farming, the industry will be moving on land, and land-based farming, etc. So I think that is, uh, is going to be the future. I think the open pen farming, as we see today, will be less acceptable. Uh, let's say in 10 years and what it is today. So that would be a huge shift in my view. Is it, uh, when you talk about this need for change, is it uh, many things at the same time? Is it the footprint, the feed, the sea lice, the fish health, or is it two or three problems that are so big that you need to, you need to solve first? I, I think it is. Uh, I think you can take each one of them and argue that scientifically this is not a big problem. I mean, if, if you take uh, listen, if you take the ex- escapes, which is kind of uh, genetic uh, pollution, um, it's easy to say yes. Escapes are represent a genetic pollution. That being said, it's possible, and I know that from my time in Germany, it's possible to prevent escapes if you if the consequences of having escapes is that you lose your job. Or, or you have to resign as a CEO, uh, kind of. So I, I think if the measures have been much tougher, or, and there are methodologies to, to, to I mean, th- this is, is human error, so it's sloppiness in my, uh, every time that happens. So you can prevent escapes if you put enough systems in place and money in place to do that. The, um, the thesis that comes out, what do kind of the surplus feed and, and the thesis from the farms, I think you could argue scientifically that that doesn't really represent the big problem. However, in people's mind, it represents a big problem. And and uh, the another thing that I find fascinating is many people are very concerned about the mortality in salmon farming. And you can say, is 20% or 15% mortality, is that high? You can say, yes, it, it should be 10. But many people say 10% mortality. That is one fish out of 10 or, or even more will die. So, so this is the kind of the way that we as humans think about biology. So to illustrate my point, two things. If you take the survival rate of migrating smolt from wild salmon from a river, if there are 100 smolt when that goes out of the river, between three and five comes back. In other words, it's 95 to 97% mortality in the wild, right? So then 10% mortality doesn't look that much. And, and to put it this way, if you ask a biologist, uh, they will tell you the following, that it is the reason why salmon gets several thousand offsprings, then a cow get one or two, right? So it, it, it's the way nature has 
balanced because the mortality is supposed to be extremely high. But we think as humans that it's very bad that um, that many fish dies in order for us to, to make fit. I mean, it emotionally it is right, but biologically is is nonsense in my view. But I, I think the emotion will prevail, and and people will be more happy to have have uh, have this fish on on land or in closed containment because of the source. This will be more acceptable by society, I think. But scientifically, I don't think that makes a big difference. Great answer. Just the final question regarding seafood, because I was reading an analysis. It was like a global analysis that stated that we should have six times more food from the ocean, right? Just talking about mm-hmm. the potential. Do you mm-hmm. tend to agree to that argument that ocean is still vastly like underperforming its potential or do you feel like we are using the ocean in a like now we're talking about food right it's important we're not talking about energy and pollution do you feel like it's six times more food should come from the ocean or do you feel like we are around the right area and this is of course bigger than salmon right we're talking global salmon is uh, next to nothing in in a a kind of global feed perspective Uh, if you look at wild catch of fish and aquaculture, salmon is kind of minute. It, it doesn't really matter in the big, big picture, just to have that perspective. Now, to me, it's pretty obvious that in order to feed the world, we need to we need to use more, make more use of the ocean. We need to make more use of aquaculture because uh, modern agri uh, culture is kind of difficult to find more. I mean. Arable land is, I mean, more desert and uh, less water. And so you cannot really predict that we should make more and more crops, right? I think so. So I think is that we need to be much more smarter to which animals that we feed. So, in other words, it's much better to feed a fish or a salmon than it is to feed a, feed a cow. Kind of a food conversion ratio. That I think will, that will, that's the only way that we can enable the world to feed itself. Now, if you ask, do you get more out of the ocean? I said, yes, probably. But if you look at the very big uh, stocks of fish, kind of anchoveta in, in Peru, if you look at Pollock in, in the Pacific North Coast, uh, Carnotin Coast, uh, herring, mackerel, etc., I would argue that by and large, these stocks are reasonable, reasonably well managed, right? Uh, clearly, you could argue that. It's not optimal, but, but I mean, if you look at Lanchavete, which is the biggest single stock, it's extremely well managed. So I don't think you can get more out of wild catch to any particular degree. You can probably make better use of bycatch and guts and whatnot, but that, that is that is uh, it's not going to make that much of a difference, probably in a feed context, but, but not, not for feeding people. So, and I think it is an illusion. To, to squeeze much more out of, say, Norwegian waters when salmon farming. I think Chile is an excellent example where the biomass, although it's a long coastline and all of that, but the biomass is so big that it creates a lot of problems with pathogens and parasites, etc. We see the same thing in Norway. We have a lot of different diseases. We have sea lice. And I, I think it's Everyone that has been working in that industry for some time will understand that will tell you that the limits to the limits to growth in the coastal waters of Norway are, are limited. I, th- I think we are getting to the limit. I mean, if but if you take a kind of aerial photo of the Norwegian coastline, you see you kind of put where the family farms are, you say intuitively you can put thousand thousand many farms and and and, and Synthef has been great in extrapolating and in finding out that we can make five times as much. And I would say, no, we can't because there's not enough feed. And, but I don't think it's not enough, uh, let's say, biological space in the current farming methods. So if we want to grow, we need to grow on land somehow. Uh, that, at least that, that is my... Uh, it, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Um, I think a lot of the good initiatives that is taking place, will they will see that it's very complex to farm salmon on land. For a number of reasons, but I'm sure that the industry will solve the operational problems that it's experienced today. And I think it's just a matter of time before that will be common 
and and uh, economically viable and what a lot of people want to invest. That's an excellent summary. So just a last theme because time is going so fast here, but you enjoy being on the boards. You have seen many boards. You have been on many boards, but you also been a CEO. So in your mind, is it fair to say you now prefer being in the board? And what's the reason behind that? Is it because you can be on many boards at the same time because it's harder to be a CEO in five different companies? Because how's that journey been? Because some great leaders tend to stay CEO, but some people tend to go over to more a board position. So how did that journey look in your perspective? I, I don't know. It, it's not, uh, I, I think the, in, in my case, the choice have kind of just uh, developed by itself. I mean, it's, uh, it has to do with age. I, I think some people can be 65 and, and a CEO for a large corporation, but I, I do not have the energy to do that. And and uh, you, I think you should only do that as long as you think you're contributing. And at the given point in time, I think there are younger people that should, with more energy, that should take this role. So, for me, it was an easy decision not to discontinue to be a CEO, so to say. And and uh, since I already had some experience in board work, um, uh, I enjoyed doing that. And. Um, it's totally different, but uh, I think uh, I, I've been to boards that have been totally dysfunctional and boards that have been very, very effective, I would say. Um, and um, I, I think the most important thing is to is to get the, the right dialogue between the CEO and the board. And that has to do with trust, it has to do with openness, and has to do with the notion that the board is there basically to help administration to do a better job. And uh, I've seen boards that try to do the job of the administration. That doesn't really work. And I see administrations that are treating the board as just someone who needs to sign the dotted line. And that is not going to work either. But um, there are some people, and we have something called um, Steve Institute in Norwegian, which is a kind of institute of board of directors, where a lot of the very experienced uh, Board members in this country meet regularly and discuss things. So, if you have the chance to, if you have a chance to interview Birgit Magnus, who is the chair of, uh, has been chair of many companies, but see today is uh, he is in, in the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. Birgit is a guy that has the best, I think, perspective of what it takes to be a good chair and a good board member. So. So to the extent I have some views there, they were very much inspired by his experience. And, and basically, to, you, you need to get that dialogue so that no one is going in to win a board meeting. I remember from my days as CEO, you were kind of thought you won the board meeting because the, you, you, the board signed off on everything. Uh, and, and you won because you gave them so much to read that uh, they got totally dizzy. Uh, but of course, you, you never got back the guidance you should have. And some people will be afraid as CEO to get guidance because you may get the guidance you don't want. But, uh, but I think if you build up the trust that you're in the, in the same room to help, the board is here to help, basically. Clearly, you have some functions to, to select the, the, the right leadership at any given point in time. You have a control function and a strategic function. All of this is important. So you Somehow you need to have some kind of distance, but you still have to be a very close relationship and trust. And, and in, in the CEO situation for I'm sure that is exactly the kind of dynamic that I try to create. Uh, to what extent I'm successful, you have to ask the CEOs <laughs> if, if, if that works. But, but, but it is the, to the extent I've learned anything, I think I've learned partly by experience, but a lot from people like Billy Magnus and, and quite a few others that are very skilled. So I would say to anyone that wants to have a career, if you like, as, as a board member, uh, to be listening into Steve Institute because there's a lot of smart people that are uh, sharing their experiences for free. Actually, that doesn't happen that often. If you add one component to boards, which I found, find fascinating, if you look at age, right? Mm. There's no secret that if you go to a board, it's a lot of older people with CEO experience. And I see some people say that it should really be at least one person under 35 on every board because many boards don't have the representations in terms of the age. Do you feel like that's a valid point or do you feel like it should be just experience that is sort of the lenses through the boards? 
Because if you take 10 boards, right, you will find not many people are under 40 years, probably. No. No, I, I, I think it's a, I, I, I would be the first one to sign off on diversity. Um, uh, in other words, just uh, seven men at my age is, is not going to make a good work with the same type of experience. I, I still believe, though, that you need to compose, a, not look so much. I think, okay, gender is important, age differential is important, but to have a young person just for the heck of having a young person, I, I think it, it's, it's like some, for, for some, some people for a while thought that you needed to have some experts in the digitalization. And, and, and by, I mean, if, I will hard to point out any experts in uh, artificial intelligence or, or digitalization that is above 35. But so then you get some experts in a board that is what they're good at, but they can't really communicate with everyone because the rest of the board doesn't understand what they're talking about, right? So I think the way to solve that is that you bring in people with that expertise in certain sessions to discuss with the board, inspire the board together with the administration. Uh, but not have them as regular board members. And, and uh, I, I don't think that is uh, good. But um, to have a big, let's say, I mean, there are a lot of 35-year-old, extremely clever people that you can put in uh, that are highly qualified for the board. So, so I'm, I'm not too worried, but I wouldn't just pick a young person because of the age. That makes total sense. So just like the last question, reflecting a bit, so... I guess you have been mentored to many people. You are obviously on the boards. Do you have any general advice you give to people who want to have an impact or is everything so specialized that you can't really generalize any advice? Or do you have any principles you try to bring along to the next generation or the next CEO in line, sort of? I don't know, really. I think that the most important thing is to be, I think, openness honesty, and to try to, to establish this open and honest dialogue with, with the, uh, the uh, CEO between the chair and the CEO is so important. So that has to do with trust. And I, I think if you sometimes you're able to establish a trust, otherwise you're not able to establish a trust. And I, I think it is um, the most important thing for a board really is to be cheer leaders or to cheer the administration. And try to so so let's say I used to ask the CEOs in the end of the meetings if they had more energy going out of the meeting than coming into the meeting, and and if they have less energy uh, and they were kind of then we need to sit down. What happened that gave you that? I mean, clearly they had a bad performance, and, and that could be it. But so so I, I think it's important to understand to what extent uh, the administration is getting inspired and getting be proud of what they do. And uh, so, so you have to be very conscious to give people energy, not only use your fingers and the, the Q1 result wasn't good enough, you need to increase the growth margin. All of that is fine, but you also have to, to, to not to forget that you, you have to, to cheer up. That's the perfect ending, uh, Jon. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for listening. Pleasure. Thank you for watching this video. If you like it, please make sure to subscribe to our channel. It helps us reach more people who are interested in business, ocean, and investments. See you next time.